Hey everyone, back again. All right, let us finish up John Locke's Second Treatise of Government, starting from part eight. Uh, but yeah, you know the drill. If you haven't listened to the first episode, what are you doing? Go listen to that. It'll be great guidance for you. If you haven't already, go follow me on other things. Like, share, subscribe, tell your friends. Who knows? They might love it. And uh, yeah, let's jump into chapter eight for the second half of John Locke's Second Treatise of Government with chapter eight of the beginning of political society. So where did where'd political society start? Where did civil society start? Where did the Commonwealth start? Once a Commonwealth is established for John Locke, it has to be guided by the majority, where he doesn't live in a kind of fairy tale land like Hobbes did, where for Hobbes, once the sovereign has been established that no one can challenge the sovereign's rule. That's just the sovereign is it. That's that's it. John Locke is more willing to acknowledge that things will change. People change. There's going to then need to be some kind of adaptation. So any changes, though, need to be guided by the majority. It needs to be in the majority's interest. And people are willing to participate in such a way because the Commonwealth itself, the civil society, was established with the people's consent to be ruled in such a way but that they'd still have some kind of control over, they'd still be a part of. Where for John Locke, nobody willingly gives up their liberty. Nobody would willingly be like, yes, let us live under tyranny. That would be so fun. For him, people are ultimately guided by the desire to maintain and protect their own liberty. So like historically, there have been innumerable empires or communities and civilizations that have done this, like Rome, the Roman Republic, people apparently, you know, ostensibly being able to engage politically, where you had the Roman, uh, kind of, Rome was ruled by kings for much of its history, and then people were clearly upset with that. It moves into the Roman Republic, where you have these kind of aristocratic figures who are apparently listening to the people, at least in some measure, and then applying what the people want to government and then that would collapse and it fell into empires and, and you know roman history it's interesting i swear i i think about it maybe for three minutes every 10 years and not you know half an hour every day so at the beginning in the first states john locke suggests that people didn't necessarily have a full grasp of nature's laws and nature's orders and so therefore they did not fully grasp the connection between liberty, life, and property, and that people are really born free. And so he suggests then that is why in the earliest state formations, people were likely to submit to sovereign rule because they didn't properly understand their own liberties, which is like, but I thought John Locke that within the state of nature, people understood their own liberties and that's all they knew. But these liberties were designed in such a way by nature so as to create a kind of order in the world where people acting by their own liberty are therefore incentivized to cooperate with others and not to fight with others. Now, it is not surprising then for him that in these earliest states that had large armies, people would then be like defense would be a big thing that the people would want because they were scared. Which, again, it's like, look at today, or at his own time with these colonial regimes when there are these huge armies being sent all over the world for really horrendous stuff. It, it's like, wow, what are you saying, John Locke? So these early states then may have just molded or mirrored what kind of authority was being exercised in the family. So... John Locke is like essentially just repeating now Filmer's argument to say that, well, maybe these early states, they didn't have a proper grasp of liberty and enlightenment because they are, you know, uh, un un undeveloped, uh, backwards people. So therefore, they didn't know any of this stuff. They were just modeling their societies over or after the power that they saw within family dynamics with the father's power, which is exactly what Filmer says. But John Locke had a problem with it then. But no, it's now it's more convenient for him, so he's going to draw upon this idea. But also, also, how does this, 
I actually get the entire history of familial family relations completely wrong because historically we have not lived humanity has not lived in these single family unit homes where you have a father and mother as the primary teachers of children like that is totally new for most of human history people were actually like raising children in a community so it's like okay how much of his idea is informed by a universal understanding of the relationship between parents and children and how much of it is actually informed by just a very specific moment in European history really where industrialization permitted well-off family units to flee the now bustling city with poor people and vagabonds and dirty people they could then flee to the country and live in a in a large home with their you know the fathers mother the 2.3 kids the white picket fence the dog you know and then he sees this and he's like of course this is the universal framework upon which we're able to understand all sovereign authority <laughs> it's just it's like it's just funny it's just funny but that's what he says because you you know if you're listening to this you probably have to know this for some reason now you're gonna know this is exactly what he says and exactly what the problems with it are or some of them. I'm sure you have better critiques, but let me know. Maybe I'm just totally wrong. Maybe John Locke was right about everything. I'd love to know. In any case, he believes that when governments first emerge, they happen with the people's consent, because otherwise they wouldn't actually be able to be established. People would fight against them. So the first states would have to have been conducted and emerged with the people agreeing to it not people who these states would then conquer, I'm sure not them, but the people who comprised the first states then wanted it. And then it is only with time and the accumulation of power and wealth that they may be corrupted and that there is nothing fundamentally corrupt about states in the first place at all. And for a very important criticism of these ideas, reading Deleuze and Guattari from A Thousand Plateaus in their chapters um, Apparatus of Capture and The War Machine, I think, are the best ones. You know, you find a very different idea about how states first emerged, how they might have emerged not out of consent, but out of fear and out of a desire to control people. So what happens then? So people have consented to this government. They've set up a government and that's great. What happens when people then have children? Are they, do they just then by natural decree consent to that nation they're born into, that government? Well, John Locke doesn't really think so because for John Locke, remember, like liberty is primary. People have to consent to being part of that government. Otherwise, they can just leave. And they must do so to act within that, within that space, within that political body, within that society by being an active agent in it. You know, by going and finding their own plot of land and working it and then being a part of it among everyone else. And that is because laws are primarily, primarily intended to protect property and liberty. So to properly be represented by that government means that you have to acquire property and work on that land. So in cases where someone wants to leave, then they should, they should sell that land, give it to someone else who could then work on it. And then they're able to leave and do whatever they want. That puts us here into chapter 9 of the ends of political society and government. So why then do people willingly leave the state of nature, where they are their own rulers, to live a life free from, you know, all those liberties, right? They're like, I am so free and everything is so great out in nature. Why would people leave that and go and live in a state? Well, simply the answer is to be protected, to feel safe from the dangers of the state of nature and to really commit themselves to civil society. And there are three primary benefits of civil society compared to the state of nature for Locke. The first one, that is, although all people follow God's laws and nature's laws, even in nature, civil society actually consecrates those laws as common standards. Because you remember, he's very committed to the idea that there are natural laws and people are kind of predisposed for order and rule, even in the state of nature. 
he thinks that there's too much ambiguity there still and that civil society helps to really enshrine and concretize these laws and make them clear and plain to see so that everyone can follow them and they can live their best life altogether. The second affordance of civil society is that it has judges. It appoints judges to adjudicate things. And these judges act as neutral, objective third parties to best exercise law for everyone, not just for one person or another. And thirdly, within civil society, because there are these laws and judges, thirdly, it tempers the force of retribution so people won't take matters into their own hands. Because if society permitted that, then it'd be chaos, just be anarchy, everyone just doing whatever they wanted. So the state works in such a way and civil society works in such a way as to create these common standards that can be acted on universally or with the exact same measures to give people a sense of comfort to properly understand what laws are and what, what it means if you break them so that people are kind of forced into submission and can live peacefully among themselves knowing that if they break a law, they might get in trouble and knowing that their neighbor knows the exact same thing and therefore their neighbor is going to act properly. But always with these types of arguments, you have to ask like, how natural is it really if you need all these laws to really keep it in check? It's often something that comes up when like, there are the certain ding-dongs running around about how like, you know, gender is this natural thing or the con connection between physiology and gender, one's genitalia and one's gender. And then th in the next breath, they'll be like, that's why we need to teach people about the proper ways of actually like engaging with their gender and make sure they don't learn anything else. And it's like, if it's natural, why do you have to worry about it? People with brown eyes aren't worried they're going to be taught how to have blue eyes. Like, I mean, that's, that's a bigger question to raise there and like colorism and racism. But in any case, it's like, why do you need all these laws, these rules to protect this thing that's supposed to be natural? If it was natural, it's just natural. That's it. So by joining civil society, people give up. They give up some of their liberties, but they enjoy the fact that they are being protected by someone else. And they are like kind of, they don't, they aren't responsible for punishing others who hurt them or hurt someone else. There's somebody else, the authority, the sovereign who will do that. And he thinks that, you know, he thinks that the state, the state is so enticing and civil society is so enticing that anyone within the state of nature, as soon as they hear about it, they're like, they'll quickly, they're going to quickly drive toward it. They're going to be like, yes, this is what I've always wanted. I will always want to live in this in this state, in civil society. I don't want to live in the dangers of the woods or the state of nature. But then when you look at all the corruption and the way that our laws have been designed in such a way as to validate and normalize systemic thievery and violence, as long as it's conducted by the state and they can bomb whoever they want, doesn't matter, no one will hold them accountable, like, are we really not living in the state of nature, the state of war? Like, really, what is the difference between the state of nature and what we're living through now? And that puts us here into chapter 10 of the forms of the commonwealth. And this is just simply what he says here is that the commonwealth refers to civil society, not necessarily democratic, uh, democratically guided by legislation. That's all. Different forms of commonwealth might be different things for John Locke. And here he's kind of similar to Hobbes, but whereas Hobbes just loves monarchies, uh, Locke is like, eh, that might not be so great, but people can organize differently. For him, it's like Republican values are really the, the key central thing where the people have power, they vote people in, uh, there's a lot of checks and balances, there's many different kind of arms of society that keep other ones in check, like in the states, on paper, some of the things the states d does well or do well, the states does well. It's like you have the executive branch with the president, you have the house and you have the senate, and they each have very specific roles that are very separate. 
the people appointed to each and who are elected to each do so very differently. And it's quite easy for, in some cases, regular everyday people to actually occupy a position in the house. <laughs> and they can then, they have a lot of power over the other branches. Of course, one of the problems then is that it can be difficult to actually get stuff done, where if it doesn't align with everyone's interest, then it's just at a standstill and nothing, nothing progresses. And that puts us here into chapter 11 of the extent of the legislative power. So legislated laws must have received the people's approval. It can't just happen randomly. Like our ruler who doesn't like baguette can't wake up one morning and be like, no more baguette. That wouldn't be, that wouldn't be just. So as such, it must mirror the state of nature. It's a very interesting point. Legislated laws and legislation have to in part borrow from some of the logic of the state of nature. Insofar as in the state of nature, everyone is equal. So too within government and the people, everyone should be equal and everyone have the same weight in their voice to contribute to laws. So in his words, the legislative power is a power that hath no other end but preservation and therefore can never have a right to destroy, enslave, or designedly to impoverish the subjects. The obligations of the law of nature cease not in society, but only in many cases are drawn closer. So again, here we're adding to the ambiguity around the term state of nature what it refers to. Does it just come before the state? Clearly the answer is no. It can be found and reemerge within the state in both negative ways and good ways. You want everyone to be equal within the state, like they are in the state of nature. You don't though want everyone's rule to be the only rule that applies, like in the state of nature, where I have my idea of right and wrong and that person over there does and we'll see what happens. You can't have that in a state. So some things need to be the same, some things need to be different. So laws shouldn't just emerge spontaneously or arbitrarily by decree. Such a possibility would mean someone has too much power. They're existing above everyone else. And essentially they risk subordinating people and taking away people's rights and their liberties. So also no one can take property without the property holder's consent. Same goes for people in power because their job is to protect, that is not to take property. Where he thinks that people in power can't take away someone's property if like I've worked on it. You know, if I worked on the land, I've earned a little plot of land for myself, nobody in power should be able to come and take that. Of course, one of the difficulties now is that most people don't actually own their property. Most people, their property is owned by the bank. Uh, that is they're paying a mortgage to somebody who actually really owns the property. And if you fail to pay that mortgage, well, goodbye property. And he also adds that taxes cannot be raised without the people's consent, because the idea of taxes, at least at the time, was for the public good. And if they were to be raised, you better hope that you have the people's, uh, the, the, the people consent to the reasons why you're raising it. You can't just raise it randomly without the people knowing because that leads to corruption then people in power can just be taking the money for themselves now just to really highlight how highly Locke views property and liberty he provides the example of a military superior like a general or what captain or something to one of their subordinates and John Locke says that the superior can send that person to war a battlefield where they know the person's going to die, like a, just a gruesome situation. They can send them there and that military person would have done nothing wrong. But John, John Locke says that if the military person asks that subordinate to give up their property or money, then they're doing something wrong. And it's interesting to see how this works and how the world we've created and the one that John Locke assumes to be of the natural true order of things property is more valuable than life and it's interesting because like yeah i mean it seems irrelevant if a military commander was going to tell you to give up your property it doesn't seem totally related to this but the example would extend far beyond this specific one 
where John Locke thinks that, no, you can't give up those things. That's just not in the cards. Now, in terms of political power, because it was established with the people's consent, ostensibly, then people in power can't just give up their power to another government or a other corporations or something because that has not happened unless it's happened with the people's consent it has to always represent the people who are part of it and who consented to having it established and that puts us here into chapter 12 the legislative executive and federative power of the commonwealth so the legislative branch establishes laws for everyone including itself there is therefore no need for a legislative branch all the time because it's just about setting up laws. You don't need to be setting up laws all the time. That would only encourage for Locke an abuse of power or abuses of power. So the branch that's responsible for actually establishing laws then needs to be tempered. It only needs to emerge when it's the people call upon it for there to be new laws, which shouldn't happen very often. Now, the executive branch is primarily responsible with operating and enacting those laws that have been established. That is their primary role to make sure that the things are running as the people have set out, set them out to run and to operate. And then finally, the federative branch deals with issues between persons, state like it's like the criminal justice system, state enemies, foreign enemies, alliances, peace talks etc. They take on all of these kinds of roles because the executive branch is primarily responsible just with the laws, whereas the federative branch is dealing with everything else. Like, what do you do in cases of criminality? What do you do in cases of uh, geopolitical tensions or, you know, conversations between states and so on? And that puts us here into chapter 13 of the subordination of powers of the commonwealth. So the legislative is the highest body for Locke in this arrangement, but it is always subject to the people's will. It can never be like, oh, we're going to decide for you, lowly subjects. You can't be trusted. The executive branch just enacts the laws and should decide when legislative should reconvene to establish laws for the public good. So the executive branch needs to be the one to call for the legislative branch to get together and then figure out uh, how to deal with a new issue. Like one of the things that right now really relevant to this discussion is how governments have to deal with big tech companies and the changing tech landscape as that's changing like so rapidly. And one of the problems that I think that we're really going to confront is adapting not only our laws, but the way that we actually produce laws to keep up with these radical changes like with Airbnb or Uber that completely like overturn industries in just a few years and com in a completely new way. And so we, we need to adapt the way by, that we actually like keep these companies in check, for example. And again, unlike Hobbes, Locke is much more willing to acknowledge that laws should change over time. And it's not just the sovereign who decides and then that's it forever. He thinks that people change, things change, and they need to be adapted to actually accommodate these changes. And that puts us here into chapter 14 of prerogative. So we put our trust in the executive to deploy their reason with the public good in mind in order to step in cases or to step in in cases of legal ambiguity. So laws, no matter how detailed laws are, as we sh it should be plain to see right now, is that there's still gonna be a lot of debate about them in the courts. What exactly certain words mean and how they apply to real life situations. Because life is really complicated and we can only do so much with written laws. There's always gonna be some ambiguity. It's embedded within the very existence of language itself. Language is always ambiguous. It's just always, there's always gonna be some amount of interpretation there. So in cases where it is unclear, the executive branch is going to be responsible to actually figure out what should happen or how to properly interpret the law. And there may even be cases where the law is proven wrong, and so the executive may rule against it. Like if something comes to court, like in, um, there's so many like films and books where this like To Kill a Mockingbird, for example, or 12 Angry Men or whatever, where 
there were these dramatizations of unjust laws in practice that would eventually be changed that were set up during uh, enslavement in the states or post-enslavement segregation and Jim Crow laws, which can actually be changed and should be changed. And this is the executive branch's prerogative. That is, it wants to adapt to what the people need and want to best accommodate them. But it should always be tempered by the public's power. So it, any act that it conducts, any change it makes, has to come from the people and be motivated by the public good. And that puts us here into chapter 15 of paternal, political, and despotical power considered together. So paternal power, as we've already said, refers to a parent's power over their children, where parents are meant to guide children in the adoption of reason, laws, understanding of liberty, understanding of the value of property, of labor power, and so on. Where political power refers to power people have, have given up in the state of nature to be managed by another, like in the case of uh, establishing a government. So I'm not going to rule myself. These other people are going to I'm going to put the burden on them. And it is meant to protect people and their property. Just political power is meant to do these things. Now, by contrast, there's despotic power or despotical power. And it is arbitrary power of one person, you know, the monarch or despot or tyrant, who just declares whatever is going to be the law that day. Now, tyranny for him is unnatural. It's unnatural because it implies that someone is more equal than the others. Someone has more power than other people, which for Locke is, is going against nature's primary rule that all people are equal in the state of nature. So tyranny is actually a perpetual state of war and chaos, and it actually harkens back to the state of nature while also being contradictory to it, as we've already said, like this amb ambiguous place of the state of nature. What actions exemplify the state of nature and which ones uh, go against it. And that puts us here into chapter 16 of conquest. So conquest cannot create a commonwealth because the conquered do not consent to it. You cannot conquer people into your commonwealth. So as an analogy, he says that someone who steals from him will never earn his respect. He goes on to say that if he's robbed and the courts don't help, he will just pray to God and be patient in the face of this. But his big point here is to say that you cannot force people to be part of your commonwealth. You can't grow that way. Even though, you know, we've seen historically that, that, you know, people have been forced into it. When they're facing the barrel of a gun and they have two options, either bow down to the new ruler or die, people have historically a lot of the time bowed down to the new ruler. And just adopted that. It's been the, the entire legacy of colonialism. Well, not all the time, of course. I mean, that would be totally... What a way for me to erase those extremely important moments of resistance and efforts to challenge, to oppose colonial authority. It's not just as though people just were like, oh yeah, we'll follow your rules now. That's a very violent thing of me to say. So in cases where the courts do not actually act justly or do not compensate him, like in the case where he's been stolen from, he says that he just, all he has to do is just go home and pray, pray to God, and it'll all work itself out. So he's really clear that all of the emphasis, everybody, all their hopes has to be put upon the government itself. Otherwise, it'll just lead into a state of war again, where if instead his response was like, oh, well, the courts aren't going to get my money back from the thief. I'm going to go and steal from them. Then you have a state of war again. Just people battling it back and forth. No actual peace, no actual order. So no power, though, should come from conquest because no ruler should exercise more power over people than they could before. That is, no ruler should exist above everybody else and have more power than everyone else. The conqueror, conqueror, in the case of like a war or conquest, has then no right to the property and people they conquered, even those who fought in an unjust war. They may 
like you remember earlier with the military example, they might be put to death. And John Locke, it's like, yeah, well, he kind of signed up for it. But the, t- the, the ruler, the conquering state, is not permitted to actually take their property or to take away their money. But his whole point here hinges upon this very important qualification of an unjust war. Like even in an unjust war, like you can't take away someone's property. You can put them to death, you can enslave them, but you can't like take away their property. Um, he, he doesn't really say what that means. Like what is an unjust war for Locke? What is, what would be a just war? Can any war really be just? I mean, does it just happen where two, two states are just like one day, yeah, let's duke it out. Like, I don't, I don't think that that's, would that, even if that were the case, would that be just? I mean, I, I don't think so. Now there are some exceptions to this though, exceptions to, uh, the state not being able to take from people. And John Locke says, the exception is if a conquering state needs to like reap to pay their people, then they can take the wealth of the state they conquered or the property of people they've conquered, but only enough to pay the debt, nothing more. And it's like, really, John Locke? I mean, they were so, they were willing to destroy a country and people. And they're just going to draw the line when they've acquired enough wealth and resources from them to pay back their debts. Like, how can... It's just ironic because he claims to be professing these unchanging truths of human nature while at the same time being like just totally off base with understanding how humans actually act in the world. It's like, what? what? Yeah, we all read that history book where Oh, they conquered the people, took what they needed, and then left. What? That, has that ever happened? So a conqueror then will have no claim to property and will not form a commonwealth, but will just rule despotically over another group. And that puts us here into chapter 17 of usurpation. So obviously to usurp, to take, try to take over authority is bad. And such people should not be obeyed if they seize power. So if an unrightful government takes power through a coup, tries to take power through, you know, armed resistance or something, he thinks that they should not be listened to because they weren't elected or put in place with the people's consent. Which is interesting because it demands that we ask, I think, What does it mean for the people to consent to a government where if a government has grown tyrannical and the people kind of arm a militia to oppose that government, and this is enshrined within like American history. (laughs) I mean, there's a lot of room for this possibility. Then the usurpation, the taking of power would actually happen with the people's consent. And in that case, then would it be okay? Or, like, how do we actually make sense of that? Like, in which cases are the people's consent cited as a reason to establish and justify a normalized government, a a specific government? And in what cases is it denied? Like, if the people want to overthrow the government, in what cases then is it no longer public opinion? Where it's like, oh no, that doesn't count as public opinion, right? It has to happen through, like, the proper channels or something. Yeah, smart people out there, give me a give me an answer. And that puts us into chapter 18 of tyranny. So if usurpation is act of taking another's power, tyranny is to exercise power beyond right. So tyranny begins then when law ends, where the tyrant will exist, live above the law. They are not subject to the law, they will just be able to do whatever they want. They are there, they go beyond the law. And it'll likely mean the end of law because new orders will just come like one day baguettes, the next day, I don't know, uh, bagels, (laughs) I don't know, whatever. And so laws won't actually be established and they won't actually be recognized in the public, uh, public eye because they'll be changing all the time. And that puts us into the last chapter here, chapter 19 of the dissolution of government. So here we must distinguish between the dissolution of society and the dissolution of government. If society crumbles, 
so too will the commonwealth. If the government crumbles, though, the people may still be more or less guided by laws of state of nature. So if people fall into chaos, the government will too. But a government can fall into chaos and the people can still organize themselves. Like the thought experiment with this is the relationship between law and order. Can you have law without order or can you have order without law? Because you can certainly, you can have law without order. Laws can be established and there's still chaos. No one follows them. But if you have order, does that imply then that there are some kind of laws that people are following, written down or not, that guides them in their order? Yeah, leave it to you to think about. So government may crumble if legislation is changed by domestic tyrant or an invading ruler. Obviously, they're an invading army. Clearly, government will crumble if there's been an invasion by uh, a foreign adversary. So Locke is confident, though, that people will leave a corrupted legislator to form a new one. It's an interesting idea, but it's difficult to reconcile in an age of, like, of borders and national security, where you can't just easily pick up and go wherever you want. You know, you have to have your social security number and do everything by the book and yada, yada, yada. It's like, what kind of an idea is this? And we find a similar thing in The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith when he talks about the way, the power that workers have. Workers can just, if they aren't being paid enough, they'll just go somewhere else. And it's like, is that really the case? Is it that easy that people can just pick up and go? Like, what about taxes put on people like through corporate interest and making sure that they can't actually buy up land anywhere? Like, is it... Like, what kind of fairy tale world are these people living in? So again, against Hobbes, Locke thinks that people have a right to resist if their government is acting unjustly toward them. Hobbes is like, no, no, no. There's no case when people should be able to oppose their government. Once they've consented to it, that's it. They just got to believe they're sovereign and just go with it. So the victim should be permitted to do more uh, than just defend themselves, they may also attack. So if a people feel like they are being attacked or threatened, John Locke doesn't think that the only tool in their at their disposal is to defend themselves. They may also act proactively against that threat. And that is because governments, like from V for Vendetta, governments should fear their people and people should not fear their governments, which seems like a pretty good tenet. I mean, I don't think that, I think it's probably a bad sign when people are more scared of their governments than vice versa, because the governments are really meant to be our representatives. They're, they're, you know, at, has anyone ever known a representative to actually be more powerful than the person they're representing? Uh, I don't think so. Maybe there's a case. You have a, like a, a case where there's like a corporate re representative who has more power than the the board of trustees they're representing. I mean, I'd be curious to hear if there was one or representative of the political party having more power than the political party itself. I don't know. But it seems like in our world, governments have the power. You know, they have the codes for the nuclear weapons and drones and tanks and all this, all these other death machines in order to make sure that people are always scared of their governments, which seems very wrong. So for him to conclude, people are the real rulers of all governments, of all kings, at least that's the way it should be, and they are only ruled by God alone. Like God is the only thing that people are actually ruled by. And yeah, that'll, that'll conclude it up here. Uh, if you like what I did, you can like, share, subscribe. You can tell your friends. Who knows? You might love it. Maybe they hate it. I don't know. If you like what I did, do those things. If there's anything I got wrong, you can always tell me about it. Anything I excluded, you can always tell me about it. If you're listening on YouTube, you can put it in a comment and I can pin it. And then we can all see when we click on the video what like what new knowledge you've brought. You can also leave a review on a podcast platform if it lets you. I love to read them. And yeah, on that note, hope you're all well and take care.